Let's pray. Send your spirit, Lord, as we reflect on your word together, so that my, my words may come truly in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to touch all of our hearts. In Jesus' name. Um, I don't have a controller this morning. I forgot to plug it in and uh, will not. So if you, if you can look after the, the pictures for me, thanks. We continue the unfinished story of Israel in the promised land. By now, the local people are living in fear of the Israelites and their God. So why might that be? Why, why were, were people living in fear of the Israelites suddenly being in their midst. Because they heard yeah. God Yes, yeah, yes. This was about God's presence with them. God was there, God was still doing things. Things were looking promising for this nation moving into their new land. <clears throat> But there was something else that needed to be sorted. For 40 years, while they've been in the journeying in the desert, the people have not followed two practices, two physical signs that were part of the covenant between God and his people. Circumcision and Passover. Two covenant signs. Two signs that, as these things were done, said these people are God's people. These people are in a special relationship with God. Now, the fact that they hadn't been doing these things during their time in the desert doesn't mean that the covenant was broken, cancelled, or even suspended. It had just been neglected by God's people. God had still kept his half of the bargain. He still looked after his people. He cared for them. He provided for them. He led them. He protected them. All the 40 years that they were walking around the desert, their shoes didn't wear out. This, year, this week, Pam had to say goodbye to her, very sadly, to a much loved pair of shoes that she's been enjoying for many years and the soles finally gave up and they're not the sort of shoes that you can get fixed. So that's them. That didn't happen to the Israelites in 40 years that they were traveling around the desert. And here they were, now on the west side of the Jordan, in the promised land. God had already reenacted the miracle of crossing the Red Sea by bringing his people across the Jordan. He's graciously giving them a fresh start. He's renewing his covenant, his promise with them. How many of you got a credit card? Not a debit card, but a credit card. One or two. One or two. I used to have one, but I gave it up. Barclay card, your flexible friend, they used to say, although some people said your flexible fiend. The thing about a credit card is you buy what you want and you get interest-free credit if you pay back what you owe in full at the end of the month when the bill comes in. That's called a period of grace. 
And God was giving Israel a period of grace when they were able to enjoy his protection and his provision without doing their bit. Sometimes they were just chastened, sometimes they were challenged, sometimes they went through difficult times, but basically God protected them all those years in the desert. God helped them to cross over the Jordan miraculously in the same way that he brought them through the Red Sea without their doing their bit, without their having circumcision, without their having kept the, the, the Passover. But now, as they begin life in their promised land, six months in, as things are beginning to look more positive in this new land, God comes to Joshua and says, get it sorted. So let's look at these two practices and see what they have to say to us today. Circumcision was kind of like the stones of remembrance we heard about last week. It was a physical sign that every male member of the people of Israel carried in their bodies to show that they were members of the covenant people of God. It was a sign of belonging to the community. This hadn't been done for 40 years while the people were in the desert. So the younger generation hadn't been circumcised. And now as they entered into the new land, God said, get it sorted. Verse 2, you notice, God says the people are to be circumcised again. That doesn't mean that these people had already been done. And it doesn't mean that the few who had already been done had to be circumcised again, literally. It's not the sort of thing you want to do twice. I'm not even sure if it's possible to do it twice. What it means is the nation, Israel, become once again a circumcised community. Become once again a circumcised community. Now in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 7 and 19 and other places, we're clearly taught that circumcision no longer matters. The people of God is bigger than Israel. It's men and women, old and young, black and white. Christians from every nation are of equal status in this expanded people of God. But Paul talks about circumcising our hearts. Romans 2 verse 28. Circumcising our hearts. The bit of us where we, where we think and where we carry our ambitions and our hopes and our aspirations and our attitudes. And he says a similar thing in Colossians 3 and verse 11. A circumcision that cuts off our flesh, our selfish human nature. And you know what? All of us, men and women alike, are called to that circumcision. Marking our hearts, our desires, and our ambitions as totally belonging to God. Cutting off the selfish human nature bits of us. We're all called to that. That kind of holiness, that kind of circumcision. is the new thing that links individual followership with the strength and life of the community. So here's a challenge for all of us. It may be painful. Physical circumcision was certainly not a whole bunch of laughs. 
But we need to deal with hard stuff, even if it's painful. We need to deal with our selfish human nature. We need to deal with anything that's wrong in our ambitions, our desires, our emotions, and our attitudes. Or rather, we need to let Jesus, by his Spirit, deal with these things. Any stuff in our hearts that affects our witness, any stuff in our hearts that affects our participation in the life of the community of God's people, needs to be cut out as the Spirit works within us. Get it sorted, people. And then Passover. Passover recalls the story of the people escaping from Egypt. There were all these plagues, and the last one was that the angel of death would go all round Egypt, and in every household the firstborn would die. It's a horrible thing. But God said in Israel that wouldn't happen. Those homes where a lamb had been sacrificed and the blood painted on the doorposts, those homes, the angel of death would miss out. And then after that event... Israel had left Egypt and crossed the Red Sea. And each year, Israel was to hold a special meal on the anniversary of that, that escape to celebrate in faith God's redemptive work, setting his people free from slavery in Egypt. And in fact, not holding the Passover was a direct consequence of not being circumcised. Because the law said that males who had not been circumcised couldn't eat the Passover. Hold that thought. Everything about the Passover recalled parts of the story of salvation. Lamb was eaten, bitter herbs to remember the, the bitter suffering that they had when they were in slavery in Egypt. Unyeasted bread because they were going to leave quickly and they hadn't got time to let the bread rise. I was making bread yesterday and I actually let it rise the second time a bit too long and as a result it was a wee bit spoiled. But the whole rising process takes time. So just mix your dough up and wrap it up in a cloth or put it in a basin and carry it with you. You haven't got time to use yeast. They were supposed to eat it with their outdoor clothes on and with their stick in their hand and their belt, their belt around the waist ready for travel as a sign that they were eating this meal in a hurry before, before escaping from Egypt. And when Jesus broke bread with his disciples, it was Passover bread. It was the Passover. And when he did that and said, this is my body, he was linking his sacrifice with the Passover. By the death of Jesus on the cross, God was going to bring his people freedom from slavery to sin. Freedom from death. And today, Later on this morning, we will be sharing bread and wine together precisely to celebrate God's sacrificial and redemptive work in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And when we do that, later on, we need to have hearts that are right. We aren't to bring uncircumcised hearts to share the bread and wine together. In 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 28, Paul says, Everyone ought to examine himself and thus eat the bread and drink the cup. And when we break bread, we remind ourselves of the importance 
of being a relational community, Passover was always celebrated in homes. Because in Egypt, the blood of the Passover lamb was painted on the doorposts of the house in which the meal was eaten. The only reason for not being in, in your own home on that first Passover or later Passovers was if two families were both too small to have their own lamb. They would share a lamb between them. While circumcision points to the link between the individual and the whole community of the church, Passover points to the importance of the household, the basic unit of society. When Jesus broke bread, he did so in an upper room, a private room in a house with an intimate group of people. He was with 5,000, not with 5,000, not with 70, but with 12 others. And all the evidence suggests that the earliest church shared bread and wine around tables in small family-like groups. Over the months of lockdown and restriction, we've learned how important it is to be together, how we have missed contact. And part of the evidence of that is how difficult it is to get everyone to sit down before the service starts because you're aching for contact. You need to meet people face to face. We've learned that we need that contact. That's how God has made us. And so we need to ensure that in our excitement of being back in the building, we don't neglect the importance of face to face, of meeting together, of taking care for one another, of praying for one another, of finding creative ways of being together in smaller groups, whether that's online or whether that's um, just ones and twos in, in our homes. The importance of meeting together face to face, of being united as God's people. Don't leave it. Get it sorted. And then, then, after they'd had the Passover, then they were able to eat the stuff that grew in the land of Canaan. This was only six months on from crossing the Jordan. And when they ate the crops of the land, the manna stopped. I guess most of them were glad about that. Now, how many of you are okay about eating the same thing every day? One or two people, one or two, not very many. For some people, it's a thing. It keeps our life simple. Um, you know, they have the same thing for breakfast, the same thing for lunch, the same thing for evening meal. My dad ate a boiled egg for breakfast every Sunday. I was going to put a picture up of a boiled egg. My dad ate a boiled egg every, on, every day for breakfast, Sunday to Friday, for years. In fact, he started it when he was so wee that when they were moving house, as we are doing in a few weeks' time, and there weren't any eggs in the house for that reason, and my gran gave my dad as an infant a tomato and some bread instead of a boiled egg, and he was furious and said, that's not my neg. And right up until he was hospitalised, he had a boiled egg in the morning. I think my dad would have been okay about eating manna every day. But I couldn't eat a boiled egg every morning. I have one some mornings, but not every morning. I need variety. I would probably be one, among the ones complaining about the manna. God's generous grace had fed them miraculously through their complaining and disobedience for 40 years. And now they're beginning to experience a greater miracle they're actually beginning to experience a land flowing with milk and honey. Bread, milk, cheese, meat, grapes, grain, fresh grain, newly baked bread, variety. People, blessing flows from holiness, from, a cent from having a center on Jesus, 
and from, from being united in him. And then there's this funny little episode at the end of the chapter. Some people think it really belongs um, with the next chapter, but I don't agree. I think it belongs in this chapter. It's part of, part of the material of this chapter. Joshua is getting near to Jericho. He's gone to kind of look at the city himself for a bit. This is the first city they need to take in the promised land. And I wonder if he's thinking, how are we going to do this? Will we succeed? It could all go so totally wrong. Or I wonder if he was thinking, God can do this. But then, whatever he's thinking, he meets this powerful looking warrior. An angel, a spiritual being of some sort. Whose side is this being on? And so he asks, are you on our side or are you on the side of the, the Canaanites, the people of the land? Is this person, this mighty being, here as a sign that the Canaanite gods are on the move? What's he to make of it? So he says, are you on our side or on theirs? And the answer is your side, except no, it wasn't quite, was it? The answer was neither. I am the commander of the Lord's armies. In other words, Joshua, the real question is whose side are you on? Whose side are you on? Joshua falls to his knees, on his face, on the ground. And the Lord says, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Again, can you hear the echo of something from the past? An echo from the story of Moses when he met God at the burning bush. Take your shoes off because you're on holy ground. God offers grace. He offers a fresh start. He calls us to get it sorted and to get sorted permanently the issue whose side am I on? People, the question is not so much whether God is on our side. We've got worship for, for songs that, that say something like that. But the issue isn't so much whether God is on our side or whether time is or is not on our side or whether culture is or is not on our side. The question is whether we are on God's side. I have never been so aware of the divisions in the body of Christ as I have since I returned to Scotland. And we all think in our little different camps that God is on our side. The question is, are we on God's side? Are we prepared to be holy? I believe God has shown us grace and that's why as Lamentations 3 and verse 22 which Dawn read last week says we are not consumed. But as we go into times of transition in Recife Baptist Church and Pam and I as a family I believe the credit card is landing on our doorstep. The credit card bill is landing on our doorstep. It's time to get it sorted. Holiness, obedient, obedience, circumcised hearts, right relationships, unity, Jesus at the center. Get it sorted. Get it sorted.
get it sorted and see what God does.